thought, Walter? I'm honored to be here. Let me get my screen set up. If everybody could mute themselves, so I don't hear the background noise. One time I had a guy making a dentist appointment in the background. All right, so it sounds pretty quiet now. So you see my screen, Walter? Yes, pretty well. All right, very good. All right, so my program um, is on flower photography. Um, I would say that the majority of the people that uh, do what we'd call macro close-up photography tend to be flower photography because it's the most common thing that we can easily find to shoot. Now, let's start off with the cameras. Um, I have always used cameras that are basically under a $1,000, um, generally about $899. And the reason why I do that is because 60% of the people that come through my workshops are using cameras that are under $1,000. So if I'm using a camera like a pro camera from Nikon that's $6,500, those people leave my workshop saying, well, Mike's images look really good because he's got an expensive professional camera and I've got a camera that's under $1,000, so I won't get images as good as Mike does. Um, so the point of using a camera under $1,000 is to show people that you don't have to have an expensive um, you know, DSLR or a mirrorless camera for flower photography or any macro photography. Uh, I could take a $500 entry level uh, DSLR camera and produce images I could get published in magazines. So whatever you own for a camera, you will do just fine. Now, I wouldn't tell you that those inexpensive cameras would be good for other types of photography. Maybe, maybe you need, uh, you know, uh, action shots and you need high frames per second. <laughs> You know, those less expensive cameras wouldn't necessarily do that. Or maybe if you're shooting in very low light condition and you need real high ISOs with low noise, you know, a lot of times those lesser expensive cameras won't do those things. But for macro photography, flower photography, you don't have to have an expensive uh, uh, DSLR or mirrorless camera. Megapixels nowadays, you know, even the lowest price cameras are at least 24 megs nowadays. So uh, those are really nice because we can crop out smaller parts of images that we take with those larger megapixels. Now, macro lenses. Um, I own the Tamron macro lenses, but I will be honest with you, I very rarely use them anymore. Um, I am using these newer uh, zoom lenses that have macro capabilities, they say. Now, they're not, in a sense, true macro lenses, but they do get you in really close to subjects if you need to. Uh, much different than the older zooms where you'd have minimum focus in distance, you know, four or five, six feet away. Now you're, you're talking, you know, 18, 20 inches away with a zoom lens, whereas in the past you could never do that. So it's nice having these zooms that'll uh, uh, get you in really close on subjects. The lenses that I'm using in the zoom ranges is the 18 to 400 from Tamron, which is, that's for the DSLR camera. Now that is for a, a, a crop sensor body. If you had a DSLR that had a full frame sensor, then you would go with the 28 to 300. Uh, on my mirrorless, I have a Fuji I just got a year ago, the Fuji X-T30 Mark II uh, mirrorless camera. And for that one, I'm using the 18 to 300 Tamron lens. Uh, and again, my macro lens, which is the Tamron 90, I haven't used that thing in quite a long time. This is an image that was shot with the um, 18 to 400, and uh, that's a, a flower from a cactus. And it's not all that big of a flower, but yet I could get easily get inside and photograph that flower at a full frame with the with the 18 to 400. It'll actually shoot as small as one and a half inches by two and a half inches, as you can see here indicated by these two rulers. So that's a pretty small area to be able to shoot into with a zoom lens. Uh, again, in the past, zoom lenses were not noted to do that, but all the newer lenses are coming out now have that capability. And that's why some of them will say they have macro capabilities. But again, it's not true macro like a a one-to-one -one, you know, ratio of a macro lens where it'll get you into about you know, seven-eighths of an inch by an inch and three-eighths. But uh, this, this actually, for what I do, 90% of what I shoot is actually larger areas than an inch and a half by two and a half inches. So uh, does pretty much all my close-up photography. 
Um, the great thing about a zoom lens is that when you're in, say, like a botanical situation like here, this is Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania, and I'm teaching a workshop and you can see the, the people in the workshop, the two ladies there, they're using zoom lenses because a lot of times the subject matter is far enough in uh, where you can't walk in there and shoot close. So you have to have something that'll zoom in on it. So when I'm shooting botanical gardens, uh, I always tell people just bring your zoom lens um, and you probably won't have any need for a macro lens. The other thing is, is that with these higher megapixel cameras, I just shoot larger areas now. I don't have to, you know, tightly frame my flower here. I can just shoot a larger area and then crop out what I want out of that image. And with these larger megapixels cameras, uh, I can do a pretty small crop, which I'll show you in a second, and get a good quality image out of it. Here's another example of another image that I shot. Uh, this was at Madeline Island. I did a workshop there last uh, June and just placed the background behind the flower. And there's the actual image that I cropped out of there. Um, this image here was shot at the Chicago Botanical Garden. And what I really wanted out of here was this area right here. All right. But I, as I said, I don't have any need to shoot in tight to get that area because I can just shoot a larger area and then crop out what I need. Um, so it, it's such a nice advantage to be able to just shoot larger areas and then crop in post-processing. Whereas in the past, when, you know, I started out with a six megapixel digital camera, um, you couldn't do the crops like you're seeing here. Uh, anything you cropped out of a six meg file back in 2004 when I started would get distorted. So um, with as, as the cameras got larger and larger megapixels, of course, it allowed us to crop smaller areas. And so now I don't have to fuss with trying to get the uh, framing that I want in the camera um, because I know that I can crop out what I need later. Now, I want to talk about an accessory that is the most important accessory for uh, flower photography, and that's a diffuser. This is a Dame's Rocket Flower. Um, you can see the petals on the top portion there are kind of a washed out, kind of a pinkish color almost, but they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be a purple color. Uh, and you would maybe assume that this might have been shot on a sunny day and harsh sunlight can wash out colors sometimes. But this was actually shot on a cloudy day, a heavy overcast cloudy day. Even on cloudy days, we can get enough intensity of light coming from those clouds and reflections off those white clouds that can actually wash out colors on things that are running parallel to the sky. So what you need to do is get yourself a 12 inch diffuser. Now they do make diffusers in the 20 inch and 22 inch, but I've always used the 12 inch because I usually shoot single flowers. And so the 12 inch has always worked for me. What's nice about the 12 inch model is that it actually claps down into a little circle of about four inches and then you can put that in your pocket if you don't want to, you know, you just want to go out with your camera and tripod, don't want to carry a backpack, but you want to make sure you have your diffuser with you. Now, once I put that diffuser over that Dame's rocket flower you just saw, it brings the color back to the natural color. So you see the image on the left, no diffuser, image on the right with the diffuser. So this is how important that thing is, is because even on a cloudy day, when you would assume you already have a big, you know, translucent uh, filter already in the sky, you are still getting some you know, light and, and reflection off those clouds that'll wash out colors on, on subjects that are running parallel to that sky. Um, on that same cloudy day, I was walking down a trail and I happened to notice this, this leaf here. And you can see the leaf, the top portion of that leaf is washed out, it's lost its color. And again, same cloudy day when this is happening. Now, if you notice the front part of the leaf, that's, that's turned down towards the ground and that front part is 90 degrees to the sky and it retains its color. It's the st stuff on the top that is parallel to the sky that washes out. Once I put the diffuser over top of it, I can bring the color back. Now, it's not quite as intense in the color on the top as it is in the front, but it has enough color there that in my post-processing, I can darken that down to match up with the front part of the leaf. So you can see on the left, no diffuser, on the right with the diffuser. So very, very important that you have that diffuser when you go out on a cloudy day. Now, not every subject is going to be uh, in a position where you're going to wash out colors, but uh, you definitely want to have it just in case. Now, let's say it's a sunny day. 
<clears throat> on sunny days, I am diffusing my subject 100% of the time. Do you hear that? 100% of the time. I never let the sunlight hit my subject that I'm shooting. Now, there's three reasons why that is. And it's because, one, it can wash out colors. It can actually wash out the colors just like on a cloudy day. Uh, it can alter the color. It can actually change the color of the subject. And it can create shadows in areas that I might not want shadows. Now, the image on the left here is a sumac branch, and you can see um, early morning sunlight hitting that sumac branch, and it has altered the color of, that, uh, of those leaves there. Uh, as I also said, there might be shadows, like you see here, that I don't want shadows. I just want a nice, even look. Um, so once I put the diffuser between that branch and the sunlight, you'll see on the right side, that's the natural color of those leaves. And since I block that light, I bring those leaves back to the natural color. So again, you can alter colors with sunlight hitting it. Uh, you can uh, wash out colors just like on cloudy days. And then you can create shadows in areas that you don't want shadows. So uh, sunlight never hits my subject when I'm shooting it, unless I'm using sunlight for, say, backlighting for a special effect. But typically, I'm always going to diffuse 100% of the time on sunny days. And then Cloudy days, depending on the subject, depending on if I'm losing any color in that subject, then I might put the diffuser over top. And it's really, really simple. Just a matter of just directly over top of the subject, or in this case here with the sumac branch in between the sunlight and the subject. Now you're wondering, do I have to hold that diffuser? Well, you could hand hold it if you wanted to, or you could buy a Wimberly clamp. Uh, you can see the clamp has a clamp on the left side and another clamp on the other side. And you can attach this onto your tripod. So you can see here the big clamp is on the tripod leg, a little flower right here. And then uh, you can attach your diffuser in there so that it'll hold your diffuser for you so you don't have to. Now, let's say that you're using a longer, you know, macro lens, a 180 macro lens. And now you're three feet away from that flower. Attaching it to the tripod leg, that, uh, that uh, plant's not going to have enough reach to get out three feet over top of that flower. So what uh, Wimberly did is they came up with a stake system. So you can see uh, it actually has a little screwdriver that inserts into the bottom of the stake. And when you pull it out and reverse it, you can then stake that into the ground next to your flowers. And then you can attach your uh, plant onto the stake and then it'll hold your diffuser over top of your flowers for you. And then you can work your camera anywhere you need to around your subject. So a uh, plant and a stake, uh, plants run about $45, stakes about $20, $25, but it is a great, you know, assistant for you when you go out to shoot. So it'll hold your diffuser for you. You can also use that uh, plant, uh, as you see here, where you can actually clamp onto the stem of a flower and that'll control the flower if there's any slight wind and it's moving around. Uh, so you could just stake next to the uh, flower, attach your plant to it, and then attach it to the stem of the flower. So my camera settings that I use when I go out to shoot, on my DSLR um, 7500 7, Nikon, uh, I'm using that at about 1000 ISO. And on my new Fuji mirrorless wow. camera, uh, the X-T30 Mark II, uh, I had contacted uh, one of the reps from Fuji and asked them, you know, like uh, about the ISO as far as how clean I can, you know, how high I can go with clean images. And, and he said, you can go pretty high. Um, so I said, well, how's, how's 2000 sound? He says, you'll have no problem. And so I've been shooting at 2000 ISO with no issue, issues as far as noise. Um, you can use manual, uh, so you would control your uh, f-stop. The most important thing is the f-stop, and then also control your shutter speed. Or you could do aperture priority, uh, where all you have to do is set your um, f-stop, and then the camera will set the shutter speed um, for you, so you don't have to deal with that. Uh, f-stops, uh, most of what I shoot at is f22 to 32. Um, I tend to do a lot of uh, shots of flowers where I fill the frame with them. That's kind of my favorite style. Uh, and I do shoot in a lot of higher IF. So IF stops to get more of that subject in focus. Now, backgrounds are very important. Uh, in the past, I would always go out uh, in the field and I would find an isolated flower with a background off in the distance so that I could 
I could photograph that flower in an F11, sometimes F16, get all the flower in focus and still maintain a blurred background if that background was far enough away. But I found that uh, I can just create my own backgrounds when I go out in the field and use those. Now, the first started the backgrounds I started with indoors when I was shooting indoors. And uh, I shoot on my stairway here because uh, I have a two-story high foyer in that uh, area, and it has a huge window in the front of the house that floods that stairway with natural light. So it's the best place in my house for my flower photography because the light that just comes through that big window kind of just wraps itself around the subjects and it works really well. The problem is, is I don't want stairs as the background behind my flowers, obviously. So I started to create these backgrounds. And what I did was I went out into a field near my home. And uh, if you're going to do this, I would recommend a macro lens for this purpose. It does a better job uh, for what I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm go going to just photograph some of this grass here. And basically, this is what I'm looking at. I'm, I, I'm, I've got it in focus here to show you what it looks like. Now, when you're manually focusing with your macro lens, you have that big focusing ring right here. And... Uh, once I get that subject in focus, you know that if you rotate that focusing ring a little bit left or a little bit right, that subject will start to go soft or it'll go out of focus. So what you want to do is just rotate that focusing ring all the way to the right, just rotate it you know, to the right, and then rotate it the opposite way you know, to the left. And one of the two ways on my macro lens, it tends to work better if I rotate it to the right side. Uh, you can rotate it to the point where that subject you just saw will go completely out of focus. Once you get it out of focus, you photograph it and you end up with that right there. So that grass that you saw right there with that focusing ring rotated completely out of focus, got me that right there and I photographed it. And now I've got a, a natural green that was produced in nature that I can bring in, print it up, use it for backgrounds in my home. Now, some of you might think, well, geez, that's pretty solid looking, but a lot of my images that I shot out in the field where I was able to blur the backgrounds naturally, like this one here, that's what you get in your background. If you've got grass back there and you, you, you know, blow it out, uh, you're going to have that solid green. So that is a natural color that I would get when I shoot flowers out in the field. Uh, and that background is far enough away where I can blur it out. Um, Let's say that you decided that you wanted a little bit of texture in there, maybe a little bit of blotchiness, or you didn't want it just a solid color. Well, when you're taking that focusing ring out of focus, just don't take it to a solid color. Leave a little bit of details in there, and you'll end up with something like that. So you can take it to whatever level you want and stop, photograph it, and then you can go ahead and print these up. Now, if you're shooting some brown grasses with little yellow flowers, you're going to get a little different you know, color a little of a, 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 a different shade of green. Uh, here I've got some pinks that I'm shooting. I get some pink shades in the greens. And you can go to botanical gardens, just photograph flowers in big groups, take them out of focus, and you'll get all types of different colors that you can use. Now, <clears throat> I was using these backgrounds mainly indoors. But then it started to dawn on me, I thought, why, why can't I take these outdoors and use them? <laughs> so instead of me having to find this isolated flower with a background off in the distance and, and searching out those special flowers, I could take any flower and just pop a background behind it. And it's going to look just like I shot it naturally out in the field. Now you can handhold these like you see here. So I just set up my camera, photograph my flower and I handhold the uh, background behind it. Now you're going to need to, um, use some type of material to stiffen that print up because you know the print's floppy right and you're going to want to use a matte paper on this when you print them don't use anything with gloss on it don't use semi-glosses or you know um, lusters or anything with gloss you want to have a matte paper a flat matte paper um, these prints are going to be floppy so when you go out in the field and you're trying to handhold it the thing will be flopping around so you have to put some kind of a backboard on it all right now you can use um, foam core, which is something that, that photographers, when they print their images and they, they frame them, they use a foam core behind the print. Um, or you could use matte board like you do for matting. You could use a matte board that's a stiff material or cardboard. 
And then what you want to do is get yourself um, what's called two-sided carpet tape. All right. Two-sided carpet tape has glue on both sides of the tape. So you can cut your mat board or your foam core. Uh, you can put the tape on there and then you can directly put your print right on that backboard and it'll stick to it with that two-sided carpet tape. Uh, and then those will work really well when you go out into the field when you're shooting. Now, these are some lily of the valleys. They're very low to the ground. They're very difficult to shoot and they're very cluttered. There's always some kind of clutter in the background. So you can see I have the print, one of my, my, my prints here, and you can see I'm using my plamp here to hold my print now. So I've got the stake in there. I'm using the plamp and it's going to hold my background so that I can work my camera and not worry about holding the background behind it. Now, I didn't really need a lot of the background. I just needed a little bit of up in this area right in here just to clean up this area here. Uh, otherwise, I'd had leaves and different things in the background messing it up. So uh, these backgrounds make it so much easier for flower photography when in the field or in botanical gardens where it gets very cluttered around our flowers. These just happen to be some fiddleheads that I was shooting uh, out in a field. And you can see a little larger background here behind those fiddleheads. Uh, and, and that produced that nice background behind it. Wow. And with these, you can shoot at the high F stops and get your subject all in focus. Wow. So that works out really well where you can, you can, uh, you can use your background and, and you, can, you, you can shoot at F32. And even if it reaches back, it's just going to pick up that solid background behind it. So it works really well for uh, getting your subject all in focus and still maintaining that, that clean background back there. Whereas typically when you shoot flowers in the field, uh, you might not be able to get into those higher F stops because you're trying to help blur out those backgrounds behind it. I'm at Longwood Gardens doing a workshop. And so I'm the guy that holds the backgrounds and the diffusers while the people are shooting. <laughs> now this I shot, um, I usually go in a day early and shoot at uh, Longwood Gardens by myself. And so when you're there by yourself, you don't have an assistant or someone holding the backgrounds for you behind the flowers. And as you can see in that area right there, if you don't have a background behind those flowers, you're going to have a lot of clutter back there. It's going to really mess up your flower shot. Uh, so what I do is I um, set up my camera. I frame up this image is, is what, what I shot. This is, I framed it up. And then um, I set my self timer on my camera to 10 seconds. And then I would just, uh, press the button on the camera, it would beep for 10 seconds. And that allowed me enough time to go over and put my background behind the flower uh, and, and take the shot for me. So you can do this by yourself by just setting your self timer on your camera to 10 seconds and then press the button on the camera and then walk over and put your background behind your subject and it will shoot it for you. Here's uh, Duke University Gardens. Uh, what I liked about these three flowers here is it had the one little bud down in the bottom here. So it had the first stage of life and then it had the second stage of life where it was a little larger and then it had an open flower here. So it had three different stages and I thought that was neat that you'd have all three stages right next to each other. But you can see that's the background behind it. And that's the problem, like I say, with flower photography is in, in, a, in a botanical garden situation is you're going to have lots of clutter uh, around those flowers. But with my backgrounds, I was able to clean that up then with that. Natural backgrounds. So there's many times in, when we can use the natural background that's there behind the flowers. And that happens quite often. I've got lots and lots of shots where I actually shot a a flower with a natural background that looks really nice. And I teach a, a workshop up at Madeline Island in Wisconsin, north of Wisconsin at Lake Superior uh, each June. And this is an image that I shot there. It's, the, it's a lupin. Um, and it's got this beautiful background of ferns behind the lupin. So sometimes you get, you get lucky and you get a, a nice shot of a flower, but then you get a really nice background to complement that flower. Uh, in that same area where I shot this one, there was this lupin that was growing in front of these two birch trees. And so I thought the birch trees made a nice background behind the flower. And this is some uh, bunch berries and they're growing out of a base of a tree trunk. And so the tree trunk, all the nice texture and that of the tree trunk makes a nice background behind the flowers. 
And this is something that I set up. I, I bought some flowers at the flower department at one of the stores near my home and took it out to the local park. It rained that night. We had uh, oak leaves on the ground with, with raindrops all on them and just positioned those three flowers on top of those oak leaves. Now the flowers create a beautiful contrast, nice strong contrast of the color against the earth tones of the, of the oak leaves. And this is another shot of ferns where I had uh, put in some flowers into the ferns and the ferns make a nice background behind the flowers. The contrast of the purple against the green works really, really well. And this is an old tree that was cut down uh, at one of the parks and they, they had it in this one area sitting on the ground. And this is a knapweed flower and the seeds got down inside there and the knapweed flower grew right out of that tree trunk. So again, the tree trunk makes a really nice background, you know, kind of complements the flower. Um, another little flower growing out of this base of these leaves. And another bunch berry growing out from these uh, ferns. So there are a lot of uh, flowers you can shoot with just using the background that's there. Um, this is a cactus that I showed you earlier. Uh, and you can see the cactus is the background. Another one with a nice background. And this is an old tree stump that was next to a rock and there's flower was growing out of that. And these are spring beauties growing next to an old tree that was laying on the ground. So again, uh, many times we'll shoot flowers with our backgrounds that we'll place behind the flower to clean it up. But then there's times where we're gonna find a lot of really nice flower shots where we have natural backgrounds that are complementing those flowers. Boring flower photography. <clears throat> So how would a beginning photographer compose a flower photo? Let's say that you have uh, somebody that you hand a camera to and say, have you ever used a camera before? No, have you ever composed a, an image of a flower before? Never have. All right, I'm gonna give you a flower. You photograph this flower and you know where they're gonna put that flower? Right dead center in the frame, right? Right in the middle. And they're gonna include all that clutter behind it. See, that's the kind of clutter you don't want behind your flower. <laughs> The other ones I just showed you, natural backgrounds that look really nice that complement the flower. This is the kind of clutter that you want to avoid. This is where you'd want to use a background behind that flower, right? So, but this would be a beginning flower photographer. See, they have no concept of backgrounds, all right? And they also have no concept about positioning the flower in the frame in that. So they would put it dead center in the frame and then they would include all that background and say, hey, I got a nice flower shot right here, but it's really kind of a... A poor flower shop. Now, most of you are probably thinking, well, yeah, those are for beginners, but I'm a little bit more of an expert at flower photography. So when I shoot my flower photography, I know that I'm going to place that head in the top third of the frame with that little stem under it. And I'm going to try to clean up that background, you know, either naturally shoot it or maybe put a background. But the problem with this, this is the most boring way you could possibly photograph a flower. All right. If you go to flower sites like I do, I've got 23 different Facebook photo groups that I post images on every day. And I see tons and tons and tons of flowers. And most people tend to shoot them in the top third of the frame with a stem under it. Again, the most common, most boring way you could photograph a flower. There's nothing artistic about it. All you're really doing is just documenting that flower. And I'm not telling you that you shouldn't have images like this here. It's good to have that, but you know, you want to move on and find another way to photograph that flower in a more artistic way. And I've got lots of my own flowers in the top third, you know, another one here in top third, top third, top third, top third, top third. All right, so I do those, but once I've accomplished that of that flower, I'm not gonna keep repeating it, I wanna move on, okay? Now, this is at Duke University Gardens in North Carolina, and I was there with another uh, photographer photographing flowers. She's all excited because the tulips are up. And she had her tripod on that little brick walkway or stone walkway you see in the background. She had her tripod way down on the ground, and she had a tulip framed up. And she says, Mike, she says, would you look through my viewfinder and tell me what you think about this flower and the composition? So basically, I looked through the viewfinder and what I saw was a boring shot of a tulip. 
top third of the frame with a stem under it. And I said to her, I said, Susan, I says, how many times have you seen a tulip composed like you composed this one in your frame? She says, well, I've seen them a lot like that. I says, yeah. I says, it's, it's, it's been done to death. <laughs> All right. I says, you probably have a shot of a tulip with the same composition at home on your hard drive, right? She goes, yeah. I says, so you already accomplished that. I says, why are you repeating it? You don't need more shots of a boring tulip shot if you already have one at home on your hard drive. I says, I'm not going to shoot a tulip in the top third because I've got a shot of that. I'm going to look for something that's a little more interesting, a little more artistic, or I would rather not shoot any of these, okay? Because I don't need any more boring tulip shots. So when I was looking through this little patch of tulips, uh, I happened to see this one really interesting image. And I framed it up and I said, Susan, look through my viewfinder and tell me if you've ever seen a shot that looks like this before. She looked at the viewfinder. She says, I've never seen that before. And that's what she saw. So basically a tulip that's encased in a green sheathing. And then down below, there's two leaves that are going in opposite directions, kind of, kind of just fill in that bottom part. So I says, now there's a shot that I've never seen before. I've never seen anybody shoot something that looks like that. So I've got a unique shot of a tulip that nobody else has. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for things that are unique, that are different. Because again, shooting that tulip in the top third is not going to impress anybody. Okay. It's been done a million times or more than a million times. So we want to look for things that are different, unique. So in that same little patch, I happen to also find this one here. It's another little budding tulip that's inside of that kind of growing out of that little leaf thing. And then I happened to do this shot here where I just focused on the top tip of it where the color is. And then with a small f-stop number, 2.8, 3.5, uh, blurred down into the base of that. So I got three shots out of that, that uh, little patch there that are unique shots compared to what she was willing to shoot, which was just the boring tulip. This is something I call finding character. So when I go out into the field, I'm looking for something, as I, I mentioned earlier, something that's different, something that's used, and something that nobody else has seen or shot before, because that's how uh, you're going to create images that have interest to people and going to be unique, uh, rather than shooting the basic stuff that everybody's seen before. So I call this finding character in nature. Um, is it easy to find character in nature? Well, it'll be easier for you all because you're going to go out there in the field with a different thought in your mind. When you go out, you're going to be looking for subjects that have character in them. Um, where do we find it? You find it in the woods, find it in the fields, find it in the flower departments at your local florists. Uh, there are characters all over, but we have to at least have our mindset that when we're out searching out flowers, we're looking for the characters. Those are the ones that are going to stand out. This is a um, not, nothing artistic here. This is just a shot of documenting a black-eyed Susan. has a textured center in the middle, and it has little yellow leaves or petals all the way around, evenly spaced. And 99.9% .9 of the black-eyed Susans look like that right there. So when I go into the Black Eyed Susan fields, uh, I'm not looking for the standard uh, Black Eyed Susan to shoot with the flower in the top there with a stem under it because I've got that shot. I've already accomplished that. So what I'm doing is I'm looking for something unique, something that's different, something that has that character. All right. So I happen to see this one flower right, right there. Okay. Now it's drew my eye was the fact that two of the petals were going the opposite direction of all the other petals. And so that makes it different from all the other flowers. So I set up my tripod and I do some framing and there's the first shot. So you see those first two petals drooped over the opposite way of all the other petals. And then look at this one right here. This one comes here and wraps itself around this petal here. So that is a unique black-eyed Susan flower. It's not like the other one that just has the petals all the way around it. It's It's got something that's different, has the character. All right. So when I show people this flower shot, it's something they've never seen before. See, and that's what I want. I want unique, uh, interesting flowers. This is another shot of the same flower. You want to make sure when you find something that has that character to it, that you want to shoot a lot of different compositions because that flower is long gone, can never be photographed again. It's dead in the field. 
wasted away. So when you have that in front of you, you have to make sure you get a lot of different compositions because you'll never have a chance to shoot that again. So that was a close up of it. And then I took another close up of this one here. So I'll have different compositions. And at some point I'll, you know, pull one out and show it or pull a different one out. But at least uh, I, I made sure that I got a lot of shots of that flower because it's a unique flower and you don't want to not, uh, you know, shoot enough different uh, compositions. This is a uh, purple cone flower and purple cone flower is similar to the black eyed Susan has a textured center in the top and then it has evenly spaced petals all the way around kind of like this one here. Some of them would like you here. Most of them like this, they kind of just droop down, you know, from the head straight down to the ground. And again, 99.9% .9 of these flowers look like that. But when I go into that field, I'm not looking for the standard uh, shot uh, of a purple comb flower. Uh, I'm going to find something unique about flower before I photograph it. Um, one morning I'm out there and I'm wandering through this big giant field of purple cone flowers. And I come across this shot right here. Look at that guy. So there's a seed head that grew right next to the, the purple cone flower. And one of the petals of the cone flower has reached out and it gives it a hug. Isn't that cool? Look at the petals, how they have an interesting flow to them. They're not like all the other ones that they just droop straight down, right? They have an artistic flow. I get a bonus. There's a bug on the flower on top of it. How lucky is that? Now, if I would have went into that field and just shot the first flower I came to and did the, you know, the flower head and the top third with the stem under it, uh, and I didn't take the time to walk through that field searching for a character, I would have never found this. It, it, it would have just wasted away and never got seen. The other thing is, is I tend to crop them tight. Um, if you notice, I've cut away. Uh, a lot of the flower over here and some of the petals that may have came out here. My goal when I'm, when I'm framing these subject is to pull your eye to the most interesting part of that flower. Now I find this the most interesting part right in here. It's where the hug is on the seed head. It's where the, the flow of the petals, it's the bug. And I want to make that as large in the frame as possible. Because if I start adding more out here to capture the rest of the flower and maybe a little background, I'm going to have to add more on the top or the bottom. And then the most interesting part, which is right in here, is going to get smaller in the frame. I want to fill that frame as much as possible with the most interesting part. Here's another purple cone flower. Nothing special about the flower. It's pretty typical, but the vine that you see that's growing around the stem and then grows right up straight through to the sky. That's what makes that interesting is that vine growing around that stem. Now I posted this on Facebook and some guy said, well, that would be a really nice shot if that vine wasn't there. <laughs> and I said, that's the whole point of it. <laughs> I says, otherwise, what would I have a boring shot of a purple cone flower, just documentation, nothing, nothing artistic, but the vine is what makes that interesting. I found another one, uh, a, a different year with a vine also. And that vine I captured so you can see where it goes all the way through the flower and up to the top and ends. So that makes that, even though the flower is pretty standard flower, but the vine is what adds the character to it. And then I, I did some creative backgrounds on there. Here's a two-headed Gerber daisy, two-headed Gerber daisy. Now, I was at uh, the local um, uh, Meyer store we have up here in Midwest. It's, a, it's, like a, it's like a Walmart, but it's, it's, it's huge like a Walmart, but it's called Meyer. And uh, they have a flower department there. So I go there and buy my flowers for my workshops. And I've been buying Gerber daisies for a lot of years at that uh, flower department. And they all have one stem and one head. And so when I was in there picking out flowers for this workshop, there happened to be two heads and two stems fused together. So I thought, is that cool? So I brought it home, set it up in my house, put a background behind it, and then uh, photographed it. Uh, same thing here. Uh, as you can see, I've cut away a lot of the petals that would come way out to here. Also the petals that would come way out here. Uh, because I find the most interesting part is right here. Uh, the two fused stems and the sepals of the two heads going off in different directions. Uh, again, if I was to bring out the, the frame so it, it, it would capture the rest of the petals out here and way out here, 
Uh, all of a sudden, I'd have to add to keep the same format a lot more on the top and bottom. And then this most interesting part was going to get smaller and smaller in the frame. So I tend to crop tight on these. I was at that Myers um, store again, picking out flowers. Uh, and I happened to be there on the day the tulips came in. It was in the spring and they had, uh, they had about 50 pots of tulips sitting on the floor in the flower department. So I'm going through and I'm looking at all the different tulips and I'm looking for something different. And all the tulips on these, you know, 40, 50 pots are all looking the same. But I get to this one pot here and there's one flower that has a petal that droops down and then it gets caught by this green leaf right here. And I thought that is pretty cool how that one petal decides to drop down and it gets caught by that green leaf right there, perfectly caught. So I take this, take it home, set it up in my house, put a background behind it and there's the shot. So that is that tulip, exactly how it sat in the, in the uh, pot and how it actually formed and, and fell, that one petal fell right into that green leaf. Um, Again, I cut off the top because where's the most interesting part? Right here. That's the most interesting part. So I want that, make that as big in the frame as possible. So that's why I cut off a lot of the top of the tulip because top of the tulip's not, it, it doesn't make it more interesting, but this part here is the best part. Here's the vertical shot of the same thing. As I said, when you have something unique, you want to make sure you shoot a lot of different compositions. So I did different compositions, horizontals. I did different verticals and this happened to be the vertical version of that same flower. It looks totally different than that. And then what you want to do is when the flower starts to die, as you see here, it totally creates a new formation. So I'm shooting it while it's looking really good when it's brand new as, as it forms, but then I'm also allowing that flower to just go through the dying stage. And then I'm still capturing at different points as it goes through the dying stage. So now you see the petals are all wilty and they're curling up. And, but you can see that petal still stuck in that green leaf right there. Um, so don't throw your flowers out right away. Let them go through the dying stage. You might find something totally unique and so totally different. This one I like. I like the green leaf here that grew between the the petals. I thought that was interesting how it grew between those two petals. And this one here, these, this is a knapweed, and typically these these little petals here are straight up or out to the side. And on this version here, they started to droop down, so it made it again a little bit unique. Here's a black-eyed Susan covered in heavy frost. So we typically don't have frost early enough when the black eyed Susans are out. We get frost usually around 12th of October on average. Uh, and by then the black eyed Susans out in the field are usually pretty bad shape or they're, they're gone. But we happen to have a real early frost in September and it was a heavy frost. And when I knew that was happening, I grabbed my gear. I went out to the local park and saw all these beautiful black eyed Susan's covered in this frost. So I was able to capture a nice image of this one here, a nice close up. Now, what makes this unique, what is the character here is the frost on the flower. All right. If you remove that frost from that flower, what do you got? Well, just a close up of black eyed Susan. It's okay, but it's not that impressive. But when you put that frost on there, it really makes it a special image. So, you know, I've been viewing flowers for 20 years on, on the internet. And I have yet to see anybody else with a black eyed Susan covered in frost. So again, there's that unique yeah. shot that I'm looking for. All right. Flower backsides. That's another thing that I, I rarely see anybody shooting the backside of a flower. And again, it gives you something different to show your, your camera club or your friends when you're photographing your flowers and presenting your flowers is show some of those backsides. So I'm out one morning um, it's early spring and you can see this is a dogwood plant that's got some flowers that are starting to pop out and you can see there is one flower that I could photograph the front of that flower right there. And that's what most people would do. Most people would shoot the front of the flower. And if you go to any flower sites and look at all the flowers that are posted, you're going to see 99.9% .9 of the images with the front side of the flower. But right behind it, 
there's a really nice shot here of the backside of this one here. Um, and, and that turned out to be a really nice image there. Look at that. So here with the little leaves in there and some of the stem and you get that nice white against the green. And then I pull a, I put one of my backgrounds behind it. That's a beautiful shot. And it, and you don't have to always be shooting the front side. You can find some really interesting compositions in the back sides. This is a trillium. Uh, if you've seen people shoot trillium wildflowers, they're always from the front side and you can get a really nice composition from the backside. And backside of uh, these are wild geraniums. And, and that's that background is actually a natural background. I shot these flowers with the grass off the background and blurred it out. Uh, Gerber daisies. Um, the, the sepals on the back of these things are amazing. They have beautiful texture. They're beautiful design. And these are just placed on my four-year floor in my house. I just arranged them like that, set it up, got over top, shot at F32, got it all in focus. And it makes a really nice image. Another flower in a pot. My wife is, grows a lot of flowers in the summertime, and I just happen to like the design of the backside of this one. And these were shot at Longwood Gardens. So there's a lot of good compositions, a lot of, uh, of interesting backgrounds or backsides of flowers that, again, are things that people don't normally see. And that's what we're looking for. If we want to be artistic with our flower photography, we need to find things that are different that people aren't used to seeing. Here's a trillium. That's a side shot. Now, this one is interesting because um, I had uh, an LED light that I was playing with in the house. And I darkened down a room in the house. And I brought one of the tulips in. And I shined the light inside the tulip. And what happened was, because the petals are translucent, the light that's inside the tulip created the, the nice glow on the outside of the tulip. So you can see the background is dark because I'm in a dark room and that helps uh, for that tulip to glow when you shine that light inside. So uh, you can do this with other types of flowers too. Any other kinds of flowers that you can shine a light inside of it and it'll glow on the outside. But darken down a room first so that uh, the glow of the flower will really stand out. And again, shot it at a high f-stop to get it all in focus. Now, fill the frame is my favorite type of flower photography. I love to fill the frame with the flowers and show all that nice detail. And, you know, Walter, and, and I think we talked about this in the beginning there. When we get in and do macro photography and close-up photography, we're, we're able to get into small areas on subjects and really show off some of that subject and all the interesting textures and details and, and design. So this is a, a sunflower that I posted on. Uh, one of the flower sites. And this, um, this was something that uh, uh, one of the viewers of this image had, whoops, had, uh, had made a comment about this image, okay? And it says, I like it. It's different. Not the same single flower surrounded by a fuzzy out of focus background. So what she's saying is she's tired of seeing that same old boring shot with the flower stem and, you know, flower in the top third and the stem under it with a, with a fuzzy out of focus background, which is what 99% of the images that are being posted out there. are. So she was impressed with all the beautiful detail that's in that flower by getting in close and showing up all that nice design. This is another one I got in tight on, um, Chicago Botanical Garden. It was in a pot and I just got the camera over top of the flower and with my tripod and shot straight down on it. Um, uh, nice close up of another flower here. This was actually at uh, one of my parks. Somebody had planted these flowers and this was shot at Duke University Garden. So I love to fill the frame with the flowers so that you don't see any background. And this makes it really nice if you're in a situation where you have a cluttered background and you didn't bring any backgrounds to put behind it, get in tight and fill the frame with the flower. You'll have a much more interesting shot. Here's a tulip. Take off one of the petals of the side of the tulip because it's very difficult to shoot down inside the tulip and get all this you know, all this interesting stuff you see there. So I, I just peeled off one of the sides of the tulip and shot into the side of it. So you can see all this, you know, the pistols and the stamens and all that good stuff. Now I talked earlier about cropping. Now I like this flower because I like the three little yellow flowers here. 
Uh, and again, with my zoom lens, I don't worry about cropping tight. I just get a, a shot, you know, around the flower, get the whole flower. And then I crop out what I need out of that image. So again, this makes it so much easier when you can just shoot a larger area and crop out what you need in post-processing. Same with this one here. <clears throat> I like the single flower in this one and then just cropped out that right there. Diffraction. So you guys hear me talk about F32 and or maybe 22 and you're thinking, boy, I, I don't know about that because you're going to get diffraction. You know, I've always been told never shoot over F16 because of diffraction. So inside of our lens, we have an aperture and that aperture opens and closes depending on the f-stop we choose. So over on the left, you'll see 2.8, smallest f-stop. You have a very wide open aperture. So, so when someone says, I shot that image wide open, they meant that the aperture inside the lens is wide open. And that happens at 2.8, smallest f-stop, or it could be 3.5, depending on your macro lens, if you're using a macro lens or a or a zoom lens even. Um, now, if you go to F4, you'll see the the uh, aperture closes down, F6 or 5.6, it's smaller, F8 smaller, F11 smaller, F16 smaller, and then F22, it's a really tiny opening. And if you have a lens that goes to 32, it's gonna be real small like that. Now I'm photographing this flower at F32. That aperture is that little tiny opening inside that lens. And now when that light from that subject enters into the lens and tries to squeeze through that little tiny aperture opening, it has a tendency as it's squeezing through to kind of shift and move a little bit. So when the image hits your sensor, it causes softness in the details. It doesn't create the sharpest image of the lens. Most lens manufacturers and most photographers tell you if you want the sharpest quality with the least amount of diffraction out of the lens, shoot at F8 or maybe F11. But most people will say never shoot over F16 because you're going to create softness from the diffraction. All right. So you're wondering, how do I get sharp images when I'm shooting at F32? Image on the left, sunflower I shot. You can see the details are not that sharp. That's out of the camera and that's F32. The great thing about digital photography is that we have these processing tools where we go in and we correct exposures and we correct contrast and we correct colors. We also have sharpening programs to create sharpness in our images. Every software program you buy includes some kind of a sharpening program, either a separate program or it's built right into the system. Those sharpening programs, you know what those engineers designed them for? Sharpening your images. So when my image comes out of my camera and it has that softness from the F32, I know that I'm going to be able to correct that with the sharpening tools. So you can see over on the right side, I've cropped and sharpened that image and it's very sharp looking. All that nice details popped out. Here's another image here. Same image like you saw earlier. You can see over here the softness. It's not very sharp coming out of the camera, and I know that when I'm shooting it, but I'm okay with it because I know I'm going to end up with a result like this over here once I sharpen that image. I hear so many people saying, I'm afraid to sharpen my images. You know, I just don't, I'm afraid I'm going to over sharpen them. Well, then don't over sharpen them, <laughs> you know, sharpen until they look good. Uh, but those sharpening tools are amazing and they help out when we shoot with those high f-stops because the problem is, is when I'm shooting my subjects, if I'm not shooting at those high f-stops, I'm not getting enough depth of field to get everything in focus. So I want to make sure that everything in that image is in focus. So I choose those high f-stops and that assures me that I'm going to get enough depth of field. But I also know that in my post process, I'm going to have to do some sharpening. Same with this image here. F32, use my background. That's okay because it hits going to hit that background and it's not going to create any problems. Uh, look at it now. It's nice and sharp after I've sharpened it. Same with this guy here. Look how soft that looks all through here. I, I cropped it, sharpened it, and you get a nice image over here. Another one, cropped, sharpened. So don't be afraid of the high F stops get your the main thing is getting your subject in focus and then do your sharpening uh, again whether it's topaz nick software photoshop 
Smart Photo Editor, which I use all the time. They all have sharpening programs. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the sharpening program from Topaz, which is fairly new, um, is, is supposedly phenomenal. They show blurry images that they make sharp. Uh, it's, the technology has gotten so good. Now, this is a book here. If you're interested, you might want to buy it. Go to Amazon. It's, it's, it's on Amazon. It's called Group F64. Now, back in 1930s, Ed, Ansel Adams, the most famous photographer of all time for nature photography, and Edward Weston, another famous photographer at that time, along with about seven other photographers, I think it was, started a camera club in California, and they called the, the camera club Group F64. And their philosophy was, we shoot our images where we have everything in focus from front to back, top to bottom, side to side. And they achieved that by using the high f-stop of their lenses. And that's why the group was called Group F64. Um, Edward Weston was doing this. Ansel Adams was doing this. And so most of you probably don't know this. I didn't know this, but uh, I, I found out about this book, bought the book, read the whole story about how they started that camera club. And that was their goal was to create images with everything in focus. So they were shooting in 1930s everything in focus with the highest f-stops or the higher f-stops of their lenses. You don't need to focus stack. You'll hear people say, oh, if you want to get enough depth of field and macro, you have to focus stack. Well, that's not true. You just saw how I was doing it with high f-stops and getting everything in focus and just sharpening my images. Um, focus stacking to me is a waste of time. All right. Why would I want to sit there and shoot a dozen images of a flower focus stacking, going through the hassle of downloading all those images, putting them in a program to stack them and getting this, getting the results of everything in focus when I can do it with one shot out in the field with a high F stop. I don't, I just don't understand why people feel they need to focus stack because you don't need to. Um, so focus stacking has its place. Let's say that you're going to shoot five to one magnification. You're shooting very high magnification. You're taking a fly's eyeball and fill in the frame. That depth of field, that five to one magnification or four to one, three to one is so shallow that you just can't get enough depth of field even as you shot at the highest f-stop. So in that case, focus stacking comes into play because you cannot get enough depth of field shooting that high f-stop. Uh, so focus stacking is required. But for what we do, close-up photography, flowers, things like that, you can get by with just shooting the highest f-stop and then sharpen it in your post-processing. So no need for focus stacking. Soft focus flowers, this is another style. Uh, now, instead of shooting f-22 and 32s, we're shooting at 2.8. And we're going to get very soft, shallow depth of field. Uh, and, and that's one of the things about macro photography is when you're moving in really close to that lens, you're getting very shallow depth of field. I'm talking about an eighth of an inch, okay, quarter of an inch, and that's it. So that's why I always tell people, if you want to get everything in focus, you need to go to those high f-stops because you just can't get enough depth of field in, in f8s and f11s and have to get enough in focus. This is a different style. Now, so a lot of people do this style with a lens baby. Lens babies have the tendency to give a really soft focus, really, out, you know, like a little bit in focus, but a lot out of focus. So this was shot with a lens baby. So you can see very little in focus. Now, this is not a style of photography that you're going to show your family and friends who are non-photographer, non-artistic people, and they're going to pat you on the back and say, great job. The first thing out of their mouth is going to be, why is it out of focus? See, because they use their camera phones and they use their point and shoots. And when they take pictures, it gets everything in focus. So they're wondering why you have this expensive DSLR camera and a, an expensive macro lens, and you've got this image that's all out of focus. They don't understand that. Now, the people that do understand this are other macro photographers that do soft focus photography. Um, it's a style that I... I like it, but I don't do very much of it because it's not as interesting to me as everything in focus images. But I like to teach it because some people do like to do this. There's some there's some photographers like Ann Belmont and Jerry Jones and uh, Jackie Kramer that do this soft focus stuff. And they the people that follow them love it. OK, but they're generally macro photographers. 
I've even had people in my workshop say, yeah, I've shot some soft focus, took into my camera club, put them in composition, competition. And the judges will say, oh, I wish I had a little more in focus. <laughs> so a lot of times even other photographers don't get it. But it, it is a style that macro photographers do. And, and it, 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 it has, has a, a really interesting dreamlike look to it. Now, this was done with a lens baby. And so most people assume, well, I, I've got a macro lens. I can't do what a lens baby tr does. But that's not true. You can. This was shot with a standard macro lens. You just get in really close and use the smallest f-stop, 2.8, and you will get very shallow depth of field. Now, when I do my soft focus flowers with my macro lens, I like to do it where I'm shooting into the side of the flower. All right. I'm shooting into the side of the flower because there's a lot of depth from the front to the back. Now, the way I set these up is I use the front of my lens uh, and I focus on the front part of the pedal on the tip of the pedal right here. And I put my focus there and with the shallow depth of field of that 2.8 F-stop or 3.5, depending on your macro lens, you're going to get this really, really shallow depth of field like that. Very little in focus. You're going to get just those tips like you see here, just the tips in focus, but look what it does to the rest of the flower in the background. It just blurs into a solid color. All right. So uh, I, I find that when I shoot into the side of the flower, I get uh, very little in focus on those tips and then it softens into the flower. So here, this is a, a blue poppy. And you can see, I, I focus on these edges of this petal here that's closest to the front of my lens. And with the 2.8, you can see it only got that little area in focus, and then it softens down into the petals and softens into the background. And the reason why I want the focus in the foreground, like you see here, right up in here, is because when someone looks at your image, they're looking for something in focus. It's got to be something in focus, even if it's a little bit, it's got to be something. And if it's in the foreground of the flower, it's easier to spot the focus point. And then the softness goes into the back of the flower. Now, if I take that same flower and I focus into the center part where the, uh, the, the texture is, look what happens to that front part. Now I got this huge blur in the front part. Well, that's not very appealing. So that same flower with the focus in the foreground, uh, you get that little focus where my eye goes to. Or here, I'm going to have to look through a big blur to get into that back part where it's in focus. So another flower here, I just focused on this front part where the petal is closest to the front of my lens. Same with this one right here. It's the orchid, just focus on that little guy right there, softens down into the flower. And again, this would be something that you might think, oh, I did with a lens baby. No, this is a standard macro lens you can do it with. Focus right on the tip here, 2.8, soften down into the flower, into the background. One more right here focus and this one here just focus right in this area here so again you can do these nice soft focus just with your standard macro lenses so another one here was a flower that was in a uh, in a garden and again just set up my lens here use the tip here and focus and then with that Backlighting. I had mentioned earlier that uh, I don't let the sunlight hit my subjects because of the problems of the altering the colors, you know, blowing out colors, creating shadows where I don't want colors. But I mentioned that I do use use sunlight for special effect. So backlighting, let that that light hit the back of my subject, and that creates rim lighting around the, the, the stems, all the little tiny hairs around the stem and the flowers, that sun, early morning sun, is backlighting that flower and creating that highlighting around the stems and the flower buds. Now, you want to do this real early in the morning when the sun is at the horizon. I mean, right when that sun is popping over the horizon is when you want to do this because it's going to be directly behind all the flowers in the field. So what you do is you stand in the field and you walk towards the sunlight and you watch the flowers in the field and you search out the ones that have all that real nice highlighting of the hairs on the stems and the buds. So that's one. This was a black eyed Susan I captured one morning. You see all the fuzzy little hairs on that. It, this is just a baby black eyed Susan. The flower hasn't opened up, but look at all the hairs on the petals and the, and the leaves. 
just amazing. But that is sunlight that's behind it, backlighting it. And that's not a background I put. These are natural green backgrounds of grass back there that I was able to blur out when I shot this. This was just some flower in a pot. And I happened to get up in the morning, looked out the door wall, looking into the backyard. And I happened to see that flower in the pot. And I saw the sunlight highlighting the petals from the backside. And you get the folds where it creates darker shadowy areas and you get highlights and shadows and that. So it, 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 it creates really unique images when you can use that backlighting. Rule of threes is another one that you, you know, when you talk about rules and composition, uh, you'll hear people say you should shoot in threes or, or maybe one or five or, you know, odd numbers, you know, don't shoot in twos, but I disagree. I sh I've got tons and tons of images with two. Typically you'd want to do three, right? Three like that, or maybe three like that. But I can show you images with two that look awesome. I mean, there's nothing wrong with twos. They look great. Two flowers, two flowers, two flowers. Yeah, twos work just fine. So when you hear people say shoot threes, well, if you can find three, that's okay. But if you find two, you know, shoot it. You're still going to get a great image with twos. Natural flower vases, all right? Most of y'all know that we you know, get flowers. We put them in our glass vases or some kind of a fancy vase. But I look for natural flower vases. So I look for tree trunks that have holes in them, like you see here, this little opening, this little cavity. And I buy flowers and bring them out. And I stick them in those cavity holes. And then I photograph them. Now, you want to make sure that you show that there's an opening there. If you were just to cover this whole thing with flowers, it would just look like flowers sitting on a stump. But you want to show that opening so people are looking at, wow, that looks like those flowers are growing out of that opening. Uh, so, so I search out tree trunks that have interesting holes in them. This one has a really nice, interesting hole. And the trunk itself is interesting. A really nice artistic pattern in the trunk. There was a hole there, and I put those flowers in there. And this is another one. You would think those are tulips, but they're not. They're called orange star flowers. And those little flowers are only three quarters of an inch tall. They're little tiny budding flowers. And that whole area that you see of that tree trunk is probably only five inches by seven inches. That's how small that is. It took me four months before I found flowers small enough to fit into that little opening right there. But most people think those are tulips, but they're not. They're little tiny flowers. Now, that same stump, that trunk that I found, um, I also took a shot of the same thing, but this is a vertical, or I'm sorry, a horizontal, the same, same tree trunk with some little white flowers in there. So look at the difference from that to that same trunk, just different flowers and different composition, horizontal instead of vertical. Help out a boring flower image. So let's say you do shoot those flowers and you're using those solid color black backgrounds and you go, eh, it's kind of boring. I wish that background had a little something more artistic going on there. You've got all kinds of programs out there with filters. You can even buy backgrounds and, and, and apply backgrounds over your image. Um, I use a program called Smart Photo Editor and it's... Um, it has over 7,000 creative filters and the program only costs $29. And so these are filters that I've, I've applied in that smart photo editor to these images. But I think it, I think it adds an artistic look to that image. The flowers are nice. Yeah. You can see I sharpened them. You know, they're nice and sharp now. And I applied that texture with just the click of a mouse. Here's another one. Flower, you know, Crop that out and just, you know, show the flower with the solid color background. That's okay. But much more interesting when you add some kind of a background to it along with the flower. So it makes a, you know, a kind of a boring shot into a little more artistic shot. And, and dead flowers are also interesting too. And uh, the dead flower by itself is, eh, it's okay. But then you uh, sharpen it, crop it, add a little uh, vignette, white vignette around there with some textured background. And that makes it a little more interesting. This is a crackle finish. It's like, <clears throat> it looks like cracked paint on there. Another filter that was in Smart Photo Editor. So these are other flowers. Again, you can see the softness. Again, like I was saying, how soft it is coming out of the camera. 
uh, look how sharp it is now. And then uh, I applied a textured background in Smart Photo Editor. Another one, look how soft that is. Look how sharp it is now with that background. All right, so that's all I have today. Um, <clears throat> wanted to mention that I have this macro photo club that I had talked about earlier. Um, has over 260 instructional videos. It covers all types of macro photography, flower photography, all that. And um, the instructional videos are broken down into four categories. So there's videos on uh, tips of the field from the field, me out in the field, actually photographing subject with my tripod and, and talking about the subject composition, all that. Then we got videos on composition, videos on post-processing and videos on equipment. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we have over 2,600 members from 28 countries. Now the lifetime membership is $99. You only pay it one time. You never have to pay again. You'll always have access to the videos. And it, we have also a Facebook group where we have about 1,400 of our members on there and they share images and post their images they're shooting. Um, and if you're interested in joining that, uh, just go to my website down at the bottom. You'll see it says tinylandscapes.com. And uh, in the top, there'll be some links in the center. They'll say Macro Photo Club. Click on that. It'll give you the information about the club and, uh, and how to join. Um, we also have 12 sponsors. So each month I raffle off a product from one of those sponsors. We have lenses and tripods and different things that, uh, that uh, the sponsors offer. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share on my screen here. And then if there's anybody who wants the questions, I'm more than happy to hang out and answer any of your questions for you. You can either unmute and ask, or if you can type it in the chat, you can do that too. Okay, so Jerry says, I think I know Jerry from Facebook. Uh, he says, on the backlit flowers showing the rim light, how did you get the light on the front of the flowers? Did you use reflector or fill light? Yes, occasionally. Well, actually, I, I actually lightened those front parts in post-processing. I use uh, Nick Software's Viveza program, and I can go in there and highlight certain areas within those flowers and lighten those areas up. It works really, really well. But you could use a, a low, you know, very low intensity uh, LED light, and you could light up the front of it just to add some light in the front, but you want to make sure you still maintain that rim lighting around the outside. Uh, on the sunflower, was, what was the point of focus, it says here. Um, let's say that uh, you're shooting a subject that is five inches deep. I'm going to go halfway into that subject and put my focus there halfway into the subject. If I'm using, a, if I'm shooting a subject that's 10 inches deep, I'm going to go five inches into the subject. So you want to be halfway in the subject when you're shooting as F32s or 22s. Uh, now, landscape photographer would tell you that when you're shooting uh, landscapes, you shoot one third of the way into the scene because you get more depth of field behind the point of focus than you do in the front. I have not noticed that to be true in macro photography. I notice I get the same amount in front as I do in the back. So anything I'm shooting, I evaluate the depth of the subject, and then I put my point of focus in the center of that subject. And it'll get as much in back as it does in the front end focus. It works awesome. Any other questions? Or did I cover it so well that there's no questions? <laughs> I covered it wonderfully. Thank you very much. Yeah, so again... It, it's all about finding unique subjects, um, finding a different way to shoot them, doing something different than just shooting the standard. I see, I see old Jerry there has got a backside of his uh, flower there. Nice, Jerry. Yeah, and that's a result of after taking your course. <laughs> that's great. And, and again, that's just something that you don't see people posting. And I could take you on a flower, flower uh, many, many different flower groups on Facebook and show you hundreds and hundreds of flower images and you'll very rarely see anybody shooting the backside but yet backsides of flowers can be interesting not all not all backsides are but you know you got at least when you're shooting a flower look around the back and check it out you might find something interesting back there <laughs> i have a question yeah right uh, do you do most of your uh, post-processing through photoshop or lightroom or uh, i use a uh, smart photo editor uh -huh. 
Yeah. Smart photo editor, as I had mentioned earlier, has over 7,000 creative filters and I've just transferred my images into all kinds of cool looking things with those filters. Um, again, it's, it's a standalone program you can get. It's $29. It's a no brainer, uh, you know? Um, and so you're not going to be out a lot of money and you can download it for free if you want to just have a trial version of it. Uh, but I, I bought, I mean, I got the trial version. I loved it. And so I, I bought it and have been using it for three, four years now. I love it. Um, I do use um, Elements Photoshop for cloning. So the healing tool and the cloning tool I use in, in Elements. I like that. And then uh, if I need to do any slight adjustments to my image, I'll do that in Viveza in, in uh, Nick Software. But I don't, I don't own Lightroom. I don't own the full-blown Photoshop. I just have the little version of Elements that I use for my uh, cloning. Other than that, all my processing gets done, all the sharpening, everything gets done in Smart Photo Editor. Um, and it's just an amazing program. Any other questions? Well, there's one question uh, from David about the diffuser on the chat. Oh, let me see. I never used a diffuser or are they translucent or opaque? Yes, they are. They're translucent. Uh, some people call them translucents. Um, actually, uh, I use ProMaster diffusers and I think they do call it a translucent. Uh, but yeah, it, it allows some light to come through, but uh, blocks out all the bad light, but some light does enter through, which there have been a case where even with a little bit of that light that does get through, it still kind of washes out a little color. And then I'll go to a solid uh, reflector and then that allows no light to get through. And then that'll help tame some of that light. Um, but yeah, the diff diffuser is just, I mean, they're cheap too. Um, Hunt's photo, I think sells them for 10 bucks or something like that, the 12 inch model. So it's, it's a very inexpensive tool, but I never ever go out into the field without that thing. You know, even if it's a cloudy day, sunny day, whatever, I'm, I'm always using that thing. Uh, cloudy day, just depending on the subject and if it's washed out. But uh, sunny day all the time, 100%. Cloudy days, depending on the subject. So, yeah. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything else on there. I'm sorry. Did, did you, do you use the 12-inch or the 24-inch? I use the 12-inch. Yeah. They do make in a 20-inch and a 22-inch, 20, I believe. Um, but I, I like the 12 inch cause I'm usually shooting a single flower and that's always been large enough for a single flower. And, um, as I said, I, I can fold that down into a four inch circle, collapse it into a four inch circle and put it in my pocket. And many times I'll just take my tripod with my camera on the tripod, sling it over my shoulder and go out in the field. And, but I always have to have that diffuser and it, and it fits real nice in my pocket. So I don't have to carry it. So the 12 inches, what I, you know, for 20 some years, that's all I've ever used the 12 inch model. Thank you. Yeah, we have one uh, look like this, right? Yeah, yep. And it just open. And pops open. Yeah. And you have a reflector, you have a diffuser inside. You got the five in one? The whole nine yards. Yeah, you got the five in one. <laughs> yeah, um, those are nice because then if you if you do happen to want to use the uh, reflector, which the bounces some light uh, up underneath the flower sometimes or into a dark area, that helps bounce a little light if you want. I uh, occasionally will carry a little LED light. And if, if I feel like I need a little light in a certain area where it's kind of dark, um, I, I'll, I'll light it up with a little LED light. Now, I don't use flash. None of my images, have, there's no lighting on any of these images you saw today. They're all natural light. And, and I shoot with natural light out in the field. And I also use natural light in my home. I don't use any artificial lighting. So you'll hear people say, well, you got to have a flash or you got to use lighting. No, I just use whatever lighting is available. And then anything I need to adjust in post-processing, I can easily do it right there if I need to brighten the image up in areas or whatever. So you don't have to get all that technical. This is actually pretty simple stuff. The biggest part is just finding good subject matter, unique subjects and framing them good. I always say there's three things to make a good image, a really good subject, good composition, good post-processing. It's that simple. It's not that hard. Okay, gang, we all set? I think so.
Yeah. All right, Mike, I wanted uh, to thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's fun You're talking welcome. to you guys. <laughs> I love talking <laughs> photography. So, uh, yeah, glad you had have me. To have you come back. Have to yeah. Have you come back. Yeah, I've got another program called the Properly Equipped Macro Photographer. So if you want to do somewhere in the future, we can do another one on that. And that's got all kinds of good stuff in that one, too. So, okay, guys, I'm going to go head out. Thanks for having me. You've been a great audience. <laughs> Thank you, Mike.